Thank you, Father, for your word of truth and life. For your word of direction and correction. For your word that leads us to redemption, forgiveness, salvation. Thank you for this time together as we gather in your house. To grow in our faith and our love for you. To once again remember that brutal night began with the Last Supper, Final Supper, the moment when Jesus brought about the New Covenant, the New Promise, sealed in His blood. Please, O oh God, speak to us at this time from Your Word. that we would gain an even deeper insight into the happenings of that transformative evening and the power of your love for us, each one of us, whom you chose, whom you knew, before the foundation of the world. Please inspire us all. We pray. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Everything we have to do this afternoon, early evening, has to do with the annual Jewish <clears throat> festival celebration. It's a celebration that goes way, way back to when God himself delivered his chosen children. At the time they were called Hebrews. Later they would be called Jews because of the tribe of Judah, the remaining tribes. But that's another day. Hebrews, Jews, same people, his chosen children. He redeemed them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. It's a remembrance of the tenth and final plague. There were nine before ten, obviously. And all of them led specifically up to number ten for different reasons. The last plague in Egypt, the one that sealed the deal, the power of God freeing His chosen children after 400 years of bondage, it was a fatal plague. Bible calls it the angel of death. By the hand of God, the angel of death would pass through all of Egypt, through every single home. And the angel of death would kill the firstborn son of everyone. Everyone. That is, except the Hebrews. If, if, they simply followed a couple of basic instructions, and that was, number one, you kill a lamb, and number two, you take that lamb's blood, and you paint it around the doorframe of your home. If you do that, God says, the angel of death will pass over you. That's where we get the phrase, pass over. The angel of death will pass over you and your lives will be saved. Your firstborn, all of you will be saved. Now, this event had absolutely nothing to do with how moral the Hebrews were, because many of them were immoral. It had nothing to do with how many good works they had done None, none whatsoever. None, nothing to do with that whatsoever. What it did have to do was the shed blood of the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb. This is the theme of the entire Bible. If you want to know what a general theme is, underlying theme, undergirding theme, this is it right here. This is it. The blood of the lamb that saves. And ultimately, 
the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Do you know when it began? All this? It didn't begin with Exodus. It didn't begin with the angel of no. It began all the way with Adam and Eve when Adam and Eve sinned. In particular, Adam. A sin that neither one of them, Adam and Eve, could shake. A sin that they could not rid themselves of. And you remember this, they had two kids, right? Two sons. Remember their names? Cain and Abel. They were sinful from conception. They were sinful at birth. Why? Because Adam sinned. They inherited that sin. Just like we have. Cain and Abel inherited their father's sin. Their daddy's sin. And so in order to compensate for their sin, they needed to bring God a sacrifice. Cain brought God some fruits and vegetables. He was more the farmer, the gardener, the flower. Abel brought God the best of his flock, the very best of his flock. He, he was more of a herder. The Bible doesn't specifically tell us exactly what animal Abel brought, but in all likelihood, it was a lamb. Abel's offering was accepted by God. Cain's was rejected. What made the difference? What made the difference was one was a real sacrifice. One was a purer sacrifice. One was from the heart. The other was just going through the motions. One actually cost something. See, Abel gave the very best that he had. He gave God the best, knowing that he wouldn't have that best anymore, but also knowing, at least not earthly, but also knowing that by giving God his best, he would have the best because he loved God so much. The blood of the best lamb that Abel had was what he gave. He chose from his heart to offer that. Now please understand this. This is important. In Genesis 4.4, we read that when the acceptable sacrifice for sin was made by Abel, it's one what we believe to be a lamb. One pure lamb, unblemished lamb for one person. One for one. Next we come to Exodus chapter 12 where God told every family to take one lamb and sacrifice it and to apply it, and to apply its blood to the top of the doorposts and the sides. Now, it's a lamb for each fam, each family. Initially, it was one lamb for one person. Now, it's a lamb for each family. In Leviticus chapter 16, God told the high priest to kill a lamb for the sins of the whole nation. This was done once a year for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years on the day they called and still call Yom Kippur. Now it's a lamb for the whole land, for the whole nation. You see the progression? Here's the best part. In John chapter 1, Jesus is introduced by John the Baptist, his cousin, by saying this, quote, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, all the other sacrificial lambs, beginning with Abel, were leading up to this Lamb, Jesus the Christ, the perfect Lamb, the Lamb of God. Every Lamb that was sacrificed from Abel on up to Jesus Christ were just foreshadows of the perfect Lamb to come. Not one lamb for one person anymore. Not one lamb for one family anymore. Not one lamb for one nation anymore. Now it's one lamb, the perfect lamb, the lamb of God for everyone. Everyone. Everyone who believes. Again, every lamb sacrificed in those days would have, was a foreshadowing of the lamb of God to come. 
Jesus the Christ, the ultimate and final sacrifice for sin, the ultimate and final Passover lamb. You see how it all comes together? So, with that background, let's explore very briefly exactly what took place at that Last Supper. Do you want to know exactly what took place? I'm about to tell you. First, they drank a cup of red wine, Luke 12, 17. Brothers and sisters, please understand this. The wine Jesus drank, and he did drink wine on occasion. The wine the disciples drank was not like the wine some of us <coughs> or people drink in today's day and age drink. It had virtually no alcohol whatsoever in it. You see, either it was boiled where the alcohol would be completely <coughs> the same of God, or it was very highly diluted. If you tasted the alcohol in, in Jesus' day and compare it to today, it would be the same as going to the Publix and buying a canister of grape juice. They drank a cup of red wine. That's what they did first. Then there was a ceremonial washing of hands. Now this was symbolizing the need for spiritual and moral cleansing. The third thing they did was they ate bitter herbs. That reminded them of the bondage that they incurred for 400 years in Egypt. The fourth thing they did was they drank a sec second cup of wine, at which time the head of the household, being Jesus, explained the meaning of Passover. The fifth thing they did was they sang the first two hymns of what are called the Hallel Psalms, that's Psalms 113 and 114. And the sixth thing they did was to prepare a lamb, a lamb that was then brought out and the head of the household, Jesus, distributed pieces of this lamb with the unleavened bread. Forgive me, the lamb was prepared prior to the supper. The unleavened bread symbolized haste. There was no time to allow the dough to rise before the journey out of Egypt would begin. The lamb they ate that night symbolized the blood sacrifice used on the door frames and posts in Egypt so that the angel of death would pass over their homes. The seventh thing they did was they drank a third cup of wine. Again, this was basically common ordinary grape juice. The eighth thing they did was they concluded the meal by singing the rest of the Hallel Psalms. That's Psalms 115 through 118. Do you know what the Hallel Psalms are? They're not Psalms of doom and gloom. They're Psalms of praise. Thank you, Rebecca. But how can that possibly be? I mean, how could it be that Jesus and his disciples were singing praise songs of all things after all that had just been said by Christ himself and just been done only a few minutes before? Think about it. Only a few minutes before, Jesus had discussed with his, his disciples the reality of the wine being poured into their cups, symbolizing his own blood poured out, shed for the sins of many. Hardly party, hardly hardly party or celebration conversation. Do you think? He had just predicted his betrayal by Judas, and Judas is on his way to do just that. Hardly a fun and exciting evening for the disciples, wouldn't you say? A couple that with the fact that Jesus knew. He knew it all. He knew every single element, everything that would happen to him over the next several hours. Sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, the humiliation, the hate, the lies, the deceit, the trials, the beatings, the crown of thorns, the nails, the spear, the gasping for air, and most painfully of all, separation from his Father for the first time in all eternity. 
He knew it all. That evening, he knew it all before he was even born into this world. He knew it all. He saw it all. Every painful and horrible detail. Not quite the normal frame of mind to sing hymns of praise and rejoicing, would you think? But he did. He did. Why? It's an important question. Hebrews 12, verse 2 gives us the answer. Here it is. Looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of our faith, Ready? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't sing songs of praise that night because he was excited about all the suffering. Absolutely not. That is silly. Jesus was not a sadist looking forward to his torture. He didn't sing songs of praise because you know, it, it'll be all over in just a few long hours. No, that didn't even enter his mind. Jesus sang with joy. He sang with joy because he knew his Father's plan of redemption, his Father's plan of salvation was at hand. It was reaching the pinnacle. It was reaching the point. Right here, right now, at that time. He knew his father's plan of forgiveness and salvation from the moment Adam took the bite of that forbidden fruit was being fulfilled. No more waiting. No more covering of sin. All oh, that sin behind the cover is about to be obliterated. Because he is fulfilling the father's plan. In the face of Satan. Who time and time and time again. Throughout eternity. Has tried to bring him down. But never. He's this close Jesus is. And so he sang. He sang because as emotional. As that night was for him. In one beautiful respect. He was joyful. In the midst of it all. He was joyful. Well, it was a tragic night, the most tragic night of all ever in history, filled with deception, lies, humiliation, beatings, and brutal torture. And one respect for Jesus the Christ, it was joyful. For Christ, it was joyful because He was doing what He had to do in order to save you, in order to save me. And for us, for you and for me, it's joyful in one respect, yeah. You know why? Because he did. He did. He didn't turn around. He didn't hightail it in the other direction. He did it. He fulfilled the Father's will. He went all the way. He went the distance. In the face of it all, he did. And isn't that exactly what we <coughs> remember this evening as we partake of Holy Communion? Sometimes in life, we have moments when we think we're not loved. If you ever think you're not loved, give me a call. Text me. I'll open the church. And you can come in. Take a look at that table. Remember what he did for you on that night.
and take a look at that cross. And remember what he did for you only hours later. Don't ever, ever think you are not. Thank you, God. Thank you. In the name of Him.